In this clip I'll explain how to use dummy variables to model and test for structural breaks. You may remember that dummy variables are variables that take values of either 0 or 1. So it, it will take only one of the two values, 0 or 1. We shall call the variable di or dt depending on whether you're talking cross-sectional or time series variables. So which one of these two variables the dummy variables will take depends on whether a certain condition is met or not. If it is, it will take the value 1. If it is not, if that condition doesn't hold, it will take the value 0. Now, it's this condition that depends on a problem and can be used very flexibly. So imagine you have time series data and you may have a value dt, a variable dt, that takes a value 1 if a particular period is before the introduction of the euro, which is that little symbol, that's the euro symbol, or it takes a value of 0 if the period we are looking at is after the introduction of the euro. Now, when we are looking, for instance, at cross-section data, to use a common example, we may have a dummy variable di, which is 0 if the i observation is a male, and 1 if the i observation is a female. But that's just an example. We will use a different example here. In fact, we will use an example where we use some house price data. This is a data file. Uh, in my case, I got it as an EVUS file, Stockton 3WF1. And uh, that comes from uh, the Hill, Griffith and Lim book, Principles of Econometrics, 4th edition. So if you look for the support website for that textbook, you will find the data file. And the variables we are using are the following. A price, sale house of the price, a pool dummy variable. So that's important. One, if the house, if the house has a pool, zero otherwise. And we will eventually use a variable called live area i, which measures the living area of the IFT house. We start by estimating the following simple linear regression model. So it's going to be hopelessly misspecified, but it's going to be useful. S price is the dependent variable sales price, and whether a house has a pool or not, the dummy variable pool i is the explanatory variable. Our estimated relationship looks like this, a constant of 118,000 and a slope coefficient of plus 69,000 approximately. We have an R squared, which is fairly low, just about 5% variation in sales price is explained by this, and we have 2,610 observations. How do we interpret this? So the estimated constant of 118,000, this is the expected value of the sales price for house I if the house does have no pool, because then that pool term falls away. What would be the expected sales price for the house if the house did have a pool? Well, then the pool variable will be equal to 1. So we need to take account of alpha naught and alpha 1, or the estimated counterparts. And if we add these two together, what we get is 187,000. So that would be our estimated sales price if the house has a pool. So this alpha 1 hat, the coefficient to the dummy variable is really the average added value by the pool. We should however note that of course this is a hopelessly misspecified model. We are omitting all sorts of potential variables, many of which may be uh, potentially correlated with the pool variables, so we have omitted variable bias. So we really shouldn't work with this model. So instead, we will look at the following model. We're still using price as the dependent variable, but living area of the house as the explanatory variable. If we estimate that, this is the result. We get a negative constant, which doesn't make sense to interpret, a positive slope coefficient indicating that higher, larger living area increases the price, a substantial R squared. Now, the question we now want to answer is whether this relationship between price and the size of the house, whether that relationship differs between houses which have or do not have a swimming pool. There are two possible strategies we can follow here. First, we estimate two separate models, one for the houses 
which do have a pool and another for houses that do not have a pool. And that way we allow for different relationships. Let's call that strategy one. Strategy two is that we estimate one model, but we make use of dummy variables, in particular the pool dummy, to allow for varying relationships. So let's start with strategy one. What would that look like? Firstly, we select those observations, those houses which have a pool, and we estimate a model. Here's an estimated model, or at least some of the summary stats. We have 130 houses with pool. We also estimate another model for houses without pool. Again, here are some summaries, statistics, and these were altogether 2,480 houses, so the vast majority of houses do not have a pool. And they have different coefficients, both these models, betas and gammas. Now the second strategy is that we estimate one model. Now the model we are estimating here looks at the beginning as the previous model, so constant and then living area. But now we are adding the pool variable as a another explanatory variable, and not only the pool, but also the interaction with the explanatory variables. Here we only have one, so it's only pool times living area. And we have an error term, and the estimated version will not have an error term, but will have estimated coefficients. So if we estimate this model, we, we get this model. I'm not reporting any coefficient estimates here, but just some of the summary stats. We have an R squared of about 67%. We have a residual sum of squares of a rather large value because of the scaling of the data. And altogether, we have 2,610 2, observations. It is important to understand that the two strategies are related. The observation numbers in strategy one add up to the observation number in, in strategy two. Further, the residual sum of squares of strategy two, the dummy variable model, is equal to the sum of the residual sum of squares of the two submodels in strategy one. Right? Make sure you convince yourself that it's right. That's important to understand. And then also coefficients are related between the two strategies. So let's look at delta naught hat. And that's the same, it's going to be the same as gamma naught hat. And also, we should note that delta one hat's the same as gamma one hat. Now these coefficients, they all relate to the no pool case. Right? These are all coefficients describing the relationship between house price and size for houses with no pool. But there are more coefficients here, and they are also related. So, so far, so for instance, beta naught hat is going to be equal to delta naught hat plus delta two hat. So beta and delta one hat plus delta three hat. Oh, that was a four. That should be three here. So delta one hat plus delta three hat is equal to beta one hat. Now these coefficients describe the relationship between house price and size of a house for those houses which do have a pool. Let's look in particular in particular at the delta two and the delta three hat and how we interpret these two. So let's start actually with delta three hat. Okay, so that, that should be the first one we're looking at. Now delta three hat is really the difference in slope and therefore in the difference in the effect of an additional unit of house size on the house price between houses that do not have a pool and houses that do have a pool. So if delta three hat is positive, that means that an additional house size unit has a large effect on the price if the house has a pool. And Delta two hat describes the difference in the intercept between the two categories, no pool and pool houses. Here is a question to check your understanding of what we've done so far. 
Consider having estimated the following two linear regression models. Don't worry about what the variables mean, we'll leave it totally abstract. Dependent variable yi, two dependent var explanatory variables di, mi, and that model is for all i for which a number variable qi is equal to zero. So that qi actually is a dummy variable. So we'll take variables of either zero or one. And the second model you estimate has the same structure. You have different estimated coefficients and it is for all observations for which qi is equal to one. So you split the observations in two groups. Then you estimate the following model, yi as a function of a constant di, mi, qi, qi times di, and qi times mi. And you estimate this model for all observations. So regardless of whether qi is equal to zero or one. What will, what estimates will you obtain for the coefficients alpha naught to alpha five. So that's the question. Pause the clip and try and uh, find the solution to this question independently before I deliver the solution in just a moment. Here's the solution. If qi is equal to naught, then these yellow coefficients will represent the relationship between yi and di and mi. So they are the qi equals to naught relationship because these terms here will just fall away. Of course, we already know what the relationship is for qi equals to naught observations. So therefore, alpha the constant alpha naught will be 3.6 or the estimate value alpha 1 hat will be negative 0 0.78 and alpha 2 hat 0 0.35 exactly the same coefficients as in the first sub regression when qi is equal to 1 then this relationship will simplify as follows then all these qi terms will be equal to 1 and we can rearrange the asterisk model too alpha naught plus alpha 3 plus alpha 1 plus alpha 4 times di plus alpha 2 plus alpha 5 times mi. Now this relationship, the estimated form of this will basically be the same as the second submodel on the screen coefficients will equal or the sum of these pairs of coefficients will equal the coefficients we got in the qi equals 1 relationship. So the sum of these coefficients will be equal to these two values respectively. That's the qi equals one relationship. So that means we can now solve for the remaining coefficients. We already know alpha naught, alpha one, alpha two hat. So alpha three hat is 7.5 minus alpha naught hat. That value was 3.6. So we get oh, whatever that um, that is. Um, then alpha 4 hat is equal to negative 0 0.5 minus alpha 1 hat, that is negative 0 0.78. So that turns out to be 0 0.28. And alpha 5 hat will be 0 0.2 minus alpha 2 hat, 0 0.35, that is 0 point, negative 0 0.15. So let's think about how we're going to test for whether there is a structural change or not. We need to think back of what we've done before, our two different strategies. And we decided that these coefficients, delta 2 and delta 3 hat, these tell us the difference between the relationship for pool and non-pool houses. So the null hypothesis that these two are equal to zero indicates that there's no difference or no structural change. Now, we know how to test for these sorts of multiple restrictions. We need an F-test, and the F-test compares residual sum of squares from a restricted and unrestricted model, and we need K and degrees of freedom of the unrestricted model. Now, K, that was the number of restrictions. In our case, that is two, because we are testing whether two coefficients are being equal to zero. 
Now we need to understand what the unrestricted and what the restricted model is. And then we can figure out what the degrees of freedom of the unrestricted model is. So U stands for unrestricted. So let's go back to what we did before. It's either a strategy two model or the unrestricted model is the addition of these two submodels in strategy one. Okay, so both of these strategies allowed for a change in the relationship between pool and no pool houses. So it's either strategy two or the two strategy one ones. In both cases, we had two, six, ten observations and estimated four coefficients. So two, six, or six was degrees of freedom. And therefore, the residual sum of squares for the unrestricted model is either the residual sum of squares from D or the sum of the two residual sum of squares from the P and NP model. And that exactly that same goes up here in the numerator RSSU. Now, the restricted model, that is the model that doesn't make allowance for pool. So that is this basic model up here. And so that's called the model hash. And it makes no difference for whether house has a pool or not. So what we need from here, I didn't give you that information before, is the residual sum of squares from that model. So that turned out to be, so as hash was 4.14 times 10 to the 12. So that we will soon need here. So in our case, that restricted some residual sum of squares is the RSS from model hash. So when we use these two submodels, then we call this sort of test the Chow test. If we use a strategy two model for the unrestricted model, then we just call it sort of a test for the significance of dummy variables. But essentially, both do exactly the same. I don't know, actually, essentially, it's possibly the wrong word. They both do exactly the same. Depending on what information you have, you can use either of the two strategies to test for a structural change. Both calculations deliver exactly identical results. So let's see what the result would be in our particular case. If we plug in all the information we have, we get an F stat of 6.325. So please confirm that yourself with all the information. If H0 is true, so if there's no structural change, then this test statistic is F distributed with two and two six or six degrees of freedom. Now what we need, we know is we need a critical value. Let's say we want the 1% critical value for 1% significance level. That turns out to be 4.61, comes from an F table. If our test statistic is to the right, we shall reject. If it's to the left, we do not reject H0. Now our test statistic 6.325 is of course to the right, and therefore we reject H0. Having a pool makes a difference for the house price size relationship of a house. So let's try this out on another problem. This is basically the same material as in question one, the three regressions we estimated, and I shall add some residual sum of squares to these estimated models. 399 for the first one, 332.15 for the second, 731.15 for the third, and now we are also estimating another model why I is a function of a constant di and m i, and we estimate that for all observations, regardless of the qi value. Altogether, we have a thousand observations, and the residual sum of squares here is 739.50. The task is now to test for structural change with respect to qi. So, pause the clip as usual and try and solve this question. Here's the solution. So as we're doing a hypothesis test, let's start with the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is that these three coefficients are equal to zero, which is indicative of no structural change being present. The alternative is that at least one of these is unequal to zero, and that would indicate there is a structural change with respect to QI. Now we are not given a significance level, so we are just setting one ourselves. Let's say 1% could be any 
level. Here's our F-test, which we need to use. This is now the general formulation for an F-test. Difference between restricted and unrestricted sum of squares divided by K over re unrestricted residual sum of squares over degrees of freedom unrestricted. Under the null hypothesis, this test statistic is F distributed with K and degrees of freedom unrestricted degrees of freedom. So two degrees of freedom as it is an F test. So what's the decision rule? We shall reject H0 if the test statistic exceeds the critical value. F tests are always right tail tests. I will get back to the critical value. So first thing is we need to find the restricted model. That's this model that doesn't make allowance for difference according to variable QI. Right? So and the, that's the restrict uh, so 739.50 is the restricted residual sum of squares. So we need to fill a few more gaps. What's the next one we are looking at? K, number of restrictions. Now, in our null hypothesis, we said we're testing for three restrictions. So that's three. Then all the remaining come from the unrestricted model. Now, there are two strategies to estimate the unrestricted model, the two submodels, or the model with dummy variables. Now, it turns out, and you should have learned that, that, of course, these two residual sum of squares added together give us 731.15. So the unrestricted residual sum of squares is 731.15. Now what about the decrease of freedom? Altogether we have a thousand observations and we're estimating six coefficients in the unrestricted strategy either way, either two times three or six straight in the dummy variable model. So decrease of freedom unrestricted is 994. If you calculate that, you get 3.78. So let's find the critical value. Here's an F table. And if you go to alpha equals 0 0.01, go to three restrictions, 1,000, the critical value is 3.8. Now, our F test is not larger than 3.8, so we do not reject the null hypothesis, and that means at an alpha of 1%, there is no structural change.